Hello, and welcome to the National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day YouTube Live um, conversation with the HIV Vaccine Trial Network and blackdoctor.org. It gives me great pleasure to say hello. My name is Daniel Driffin, and I'm a project manager with the external relations um, at the HIV Vaccine Trial Network. I have the honor of sharing virtual space tonight with Tori Cooper um, and also Mr. Matt Rose. We'll have them each introduce themselves in a moment. So tonight's discussion is going to be dedicated to the National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day in that. We're gonna pull some slides up just to help us out. Again, thank you again for watching us tonight on YouTube and Facebook. And tonight's discussion really is gonna be a timely conversation on treatment and prevention updates. We'll have some advocate perspectives and activists with lived experiences. We hope within the chat features, you will also be able to participate within our discussion. So please let us know um, your name, where you're calling from and any organizations that you may be representing. Um, just a little bit more about the HIV Vaccine Trial Network. Um, the HIV Vaccine Trial Network is the world's largest publicly funded international collaboration in pursuit of a vaccine to prevent HIV. The HIV Vaccine Trial Network helps advance the field of vaccinology, social and behavioral science, statistics, and immunology, as well as tuberculosis and COVID-19 vaccines. So today is February 7th, and we know this day as National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Um, NBAD has been observed since 1999, so today is its 24th um, birthday. And this day is truly geared to acknowledge how HIV unequally burdens um, African-American or Black people. This year theme is together we can make HIV black history. How do we do that you ask? We must tackle racism, discrimination and mistrust within the healthcare systems um, that specifically serves HIV treatment and prevention. This is a snapshot from 2020 that shows roughly 42% of all new HIV diagnoses across the United States of America were African-American or Black. That color gradient, so the darker the states are, the more um, new infections were present in those places. And when we think about where you may be calling from, take note of the color of your state. This is a busy slide. However, it's really easy to understand. So on the, we'll start on the left-hand side. It says Black people represent only 14% of PrEP users, pre-exposure prophylaxis, or a drug that can prevent HIV, but account for more than 42%, again, of new infections, indicating a significant unmet need for PrEP. So basically, we need to increase the amount of PrEP that is being used across Black communities. On the right-hand side of the slide, you will see the specific uh, populations and their PrEP usage. Take-home message on this side is social determinants of health are crucial. And when we say social determinants of health, we think about those big drivers of life. So um, we have poverty, we have um, insurance access, we have household income, food insecurity, and unemployment. So again, when we think about communities who sit at the most unequal or most burdened pieces of our society, those are the main drivers when we think about HIV infection. Again, many of these slides are available for free um, on aidsview.org, and we will leave these resources at the end of our conclusion. So it gives me great pleasure to have my amazing panelists to jump in here. Uh, first up, I'll have uh, Ms. Tori Cooper, um, she, her, hers pronouns, and health, 
health and equity consultant um, introduce herself. Tori, take us away. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. A pleasure to be here with you also, Matthew. Uh, as Daniel just said, my name is Tori Cooper. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. By day, I'm the Director of Community Engagement for the Transgender Justice at the Human Rights Campaign. And by nights and on weekends, uh, I am what one would refer to as a fierce advocate for all e for equity for all marginalized folks. Thank you so very much, Tori. Matt, why don't you introduce yourself for us? Yeah, I, uh, my name's Matthew Rose. I uh, he, him, his. Uh, I wear a lot of hats. Um, I think for this one, I'm using my HIV equity hat lens. Um, but I have worked a lot in HIV and health policy. Uh, also work in strategic communications globally. I've been working in HIV for uh, the majority of my professional career. Uh, it's kind of my life's mission is to end, truly end the epidemic, which means not just ending diagnoses and getting people access to treatment, but also a world where we have a functional uh, and accessible cure. Uh, and I'm here to be an advocate of the people and their health, uh, helping people make informed decisions about what happens to their bodies and having all sides of access to make the best informed decisions possible. Excellent. Thank you all so very much. So let's dive right in. Um, you know, we started tonight with a couple of slides just showing not only the unequal impact, but the fact that we've been here 24 years now commemorating in bad. So I, I, I guess I want to start our discussion tonight and we'll jump it um, to you, Tori. When you think of in bad, what does that mean to you? Well, I mean, the word speaks for the the acronym speaks for itself. Um, Nineteen eighty nine was an incredible year. It was an incredible year uh, because uh, it, it, it's it's an inc it's been an incredible, an incredibly long time. You know, first of all, Daniel, let me uh, tell every single person who is listening tell something that I already shared with them. I took some pain medicine, so I won't be as eloquent tonight. But you might get some nuggets from it anyway. Um, but it's been a very, very long time since the beginning of NBAD. And it's really important because it's Black people, um, as a Black trans woman, as however, you, whoever, whatever your intersectional identities are, there are systems that have never recognized us and still to this day don't. And so it's important to have a day that recognizes in great part uh, all of our different intersectional identities. You know, you might not realize if we're picking out melons at the store that I'm trans, but you know that I'm black. Um, healthcare systems are the same way. They may not always know that I'm trans, but they do know that I'm black. And because I'm black, that puts me at certain risk, which is a, a word, a kind of an archaic word, but it still applies in this situation for certain um, illnesses, certain modalities, certain diagnoses. But then at the same time, it means that treatments that were once available to folks who are not Black were not necessarily tested for folks who are like me. They didn't work as well. And so we have a day that's set aside to make sure that we're prioritizing our own health when it comes to HIV or HIV prevention. That's excellent. Thank you for that, Tori. Matt, same question to you. What does in bad mean for you? I think it's a it's a day of remindering and a day for us to say the bill has come due. Every year we get a chance to say, what have you actually done for Black people around HIV? And not, you know, I love my World AIDS Day. We all get to have our woo-woo moment. That's lovely. But at the end of the day, let's talk about some realities. The reality is the CDC's last number game of looking at lifetime risks saw that the risk for a Black gay man to contract HIV in his lifetime was one in two. For Black trans women, we have sketchier numbers because, oh wait, we don't collect all the data on them. But guess what, sis? It's close to us. We end this together. For Black women, see the greatest disparity among any racial group between Black women and white women when it comes to HIV risks. So really, it's a day to say, what have you done for Black people? And in the words of the government, what? What are you going to promise? Awareness days are great for everyone to say, oh, let me give something because I forgot something about you. And so I hope that they become a day where we can get some stuff because at the end of the day, we still represent the majority of new diagnoses in this country. We represent the majority of people 
living in the most high prevalent areas. We represent the majority of people who are undiagnosed. We represent the majority of people who are still dying from HIV and HIV related illnesses. So let's talk about that on Black HIV Awareness Day. Let's not just be aware. Let's start taking some real action and doing some real things about it. And like I said, the bills come due. So every day on this day, I'm going to come ask the government people because they have my coin, but I'll ask some other people too. What have you done for the Black folks? I love it. I love it. So, Tori, you know I'm coming back over to you. Um, so our, our friend Matthew is posing the question of what have you done for Black people? When we think about treatment and prevention efforts, how would you answer that question? You know, what has truly been done for the different communities that we um, call home to? So I think going along with what Matt said, we should officially change the name moving forward to National Black HIV Action Day. All right, that's my vote. Uh, so what, what have they done for me lately? The truth is not a lot um, in some aspects, but then a lot in others. Uh, what I mean by that is, in, uh, and I'll start with the, the, the former versus the latter. When we think about the things that have done, there have been incredible advances in access to medicines for many people, not for every Black person, but for many Black people. Um, there has been an incredible amount of uh, new medicines that have been able to help significantly for people who are living with HIV to live healthier, longer, better lives. There have been advances that now for some people, they may be able to get a shot. Um, instead of taking any pills at all. So we're thankful for that. That's a lot. That's a lot when literally in our lifetimes, uh, certainly in my lifetime, there was a point where there were no medicines that worked well for Black people, none whatsoever. Um, and so from that standpoint, a lot. When I say they haven't done a, a, a lot in other ways, that means that there we still have an incredibly large divide when it comes to equitable access to care for Black people and everyone else. That organizations who are Black-serving, Black-owned, uh, who prioritize Black and Brown people are terribly underfunded and under-resourced all across the board in most places across the country. Um, and that money isn't coming from the government. Not that I expect the government to provide everything, but there's an inequity there in the way that some of these organizations who are doing the most impactful work in some cases are not getting the resources and the money uh, that they need to continue to do that. And, you know, we can hopefully at some point we will talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's going on in Tennessee and that I'm afraid that this kind of stuff is going to happen uh, in other places, particularly across the South. And so th there's this dichotomy at work here where there are small advances. But as Matt just said, the fact that the CDC, we're in Atlanta and the CDC is a, a couple of few miles away from where both of us are, Daniel. Um, and the CDC just until a few years ago, they they had numbers that, that showed the Black Trans, the trans people in general didn't even exist, um, you know. And I happen to be one, so I and I know one or two or two thousand others, and so we do exist. And 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 so there are certain things that we need to really move in hyperspeed to to address um, at all different levels. Certainly at the community level, um, at the micro and macro levels. And then really from the federal government down. So we start from the bottom and work our way out and then also start from the top. And in the middle is somewhere where equitable access occurs. Thank you for that, Tori. I really, really appreciate that. So Matthew, um, we talk about this every day of the week, like literally in text messages and whatnot. But for those folks who are online with us who... Um, may only hear about HIV once in a while. Um, tell us more about what is that equity? You know, what is that equitable response? And how do we um, begin the process of matching uh, resources back to where um, disparate outcomes um, are seen? Yeah. So first I would say we can't, we can't keep coming up last. 
if you look across all the indicators, we, Black folks, if you add Black into any indicator, our people are behind. And that that can't be the case. The only people place we're ahead is in new diagnoses and not a place where you want to be ahead in. So the question is, what's missing? We've been fighting the HIV epidemic for more than 40 years. We've learned a lot of things. We've watched some communities' numbers skyrocket downwards. We have some communities' numbers who drop down, and we still don't entirely understand what happened there. We know that Black women were able to drop down and then hit a plateau. We know that Black gay men have plateaued. We know Black trans women are still moving up, which means that something critically is missing. So how we achieve equity, part of that is going to mean that we have to do things differently. First of all, we have to build infrastructure and support infrastructure, like Tori was talking about. Organizations that serve those people, that are trusted by those populations, that can truly deliver results, and can keep their funding streams diversified and open, that aren't going to fold under because a CDC grant didn't come through, or something changed at HRSA, or you know the noble person who was funding them has decided to move their funding priorities. We need Black organizations that are able to have thriving funding sources and streams, so they look like their counterparts. They have diverse revenues that allow them the resources and the mix of resources that allow them to approach the epidemic in ways that are culturally responsive and relevant to the communities that they serve. It also means that we have to throw some of the playbook out the window, or maybe even burn it on fire, because those pages are not serving us. We keep pushing things that don't actually reduce the numbers for Black people. And how do we know that? We have a whole bunch of data that tells us this. You can watch the introduction of new medical interventions into populations and see what the Black uptake is, what the white uptake is, what the Latino uptake is, what the Asian uptake is. And no matter which one you're looking at, Black is always behind. So we need to start figuring out how do we change the system and change the playbook and change the little pillars of what we're doing to ensure that we try something that is truly different because the standard operating procedure ain't getting us there. It's got to look different and feel different and touch different people. And when we do that, that's how we know we're getting equity. I like that. I like that. So changing the playbook, touching um, new populations, but also remembering how important trust is. I, I really, I really like that. Thank you for um, that, Matt. Um, hello to Queens, New York. We have some viewers in Queens. We have some viewers in um, Hanover Park, Illinois as well. So welcome to the party. Really, really appreciate you guys for joining us in. And if you guys have any questions, please, please, please tag in. So Tori, um, let's go back to you. So diversity in funding. I, I think funding is always a very interesting conversation. Um, I mean, you know, you, you said we have some nuggets tonight. Um, so, so when you think of funding, what is still missing when we think of funding, especially for trans um, trans populations? That's a question that's going to take a lot longer than this one conversation. But I'll offer this. So, uh, Matt already gave you the word diversity and, and and being able to diversify funding. That's really really important. Um, we, those of us who have been fortunate to sit in rooms with folks who make the decision at pharmaceutical companies and some of these other places, uh, we know that one of the things that we're consistently telling them is unless you're going to own part of a program, then perhaps you shouldn't fund that program too many years because you're then not providing opportunities for others. I know that's something that I've said. Uh, but with that being said, how are we setting folks up for success once their funding stream changes? Uh, what are we doing to ensure that if the health department decides that they're not going to continue to fund this work or this particular community or this organization, how is it that us, us, we's, that we are not going to then suffer because of a lack in funding. Um, I also thought of, uh, while you all were talking, 
I thought of something, and this actually has to do with funding. When I was a kid and I lived in my parents' house, my mother modeled something for me that works very, very well. And it's something that we uh, refer to as, um, crap, the word flew out of my hand. But she would talk one way with her coworkers in a different way that she would speak with her sisters. A little code and switch? Thank you, code switching. Thank you. Code switching. She was code switching and she taught me how to do it even when she didn't realize she was doing it. And what I learned from that from a kid and have now adapted into my work is nobody can talk to black women like black women. Nobody can understand trans people better than other trans people. And nobody knows black gay men better than black gay men. And so if we want to talk about funding, what's missing? What's missing is actually have people in position who represent the communities that you're serving also. That means that the folks who are writing the checks often, you know, they may be the same folks who are partying, or they at least have some similar backgrounds as the folks, because they'll understand that there's a, when there's sameness or there's similarities, often what happens is there's a connectedness that happens. It means that funding entities are a bit more connected to the work. They understand what folks are saying when they write priority population. They understand when you see certain zip codes, what that means. They understand when you use terms like kiki ball, they know what that is. That means in every case they will. But what's missing is actually having folks who represent the communities and positions of power so that they can put the funding where it's needed most. Put the funding where it's needed the most and also placing the best equipped people in positions. Matt, what else? Ooh, I mean, you need, Tori was right. You need braided funding. We can't have anyone stuck on a single site. We need the ability to think, we need funding that accesses not, as like one of my big pushes has been over the last few years is telling the bigger organizations to get off HIV dollars. Uh, you have the ability to bill for other things. If people have insurance, let them bill that insurance. Help people get money through other mechanisms. And if we're in the system of capitalism, what we are in, we should wait, find the way to capital gets let people to bill. And also CBO should get to find a way to bill because we do valuable services around linkage, around retention, around stopping people from having to come back in. But we have to find and talk about models and ways of funding people that make it so that people aren't so dependent on the swings of administrations, year to year priorities, but are actually doing some of the background work to drive numbers down. And we also we also just need to be innovative in our funding. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Dimitri Jakalakis, who some of you might know, uh, who leads the is the deputy coordinator for the White House MPOX response, but also is the head of prevention at CDC. When he was in New York. One of the most innovative things he did was he paid trans organizations just to exist. Like, you didn't need to turn in this X amount of tests, see X amount of people. I just need you to exist. So let me give you some seed money that allows you to set up the things you need to do as an organization. And once you do that and know that you're going to be comfortable, then we can talk about how do you deliver more for your community. But we really need to think about how we're setting people up for success and how we find funding to do such. It's so important to get that key infrastructure in the beginning and then make sure that you can pay for things. Like general operations, nobody wants to pay for you to have an accountant, but everybody wants you to have your books audited. Nobody wants to pay for the comms person, but everybody gets mad when there's not a communication saying what the organization is doing. So we need to figure out a way to make sure these structural things to run an organization exist and that there are leaders and programs designed to help people of color do these things. And we know people of color can do them because Daniel and I started an organization a while back that has seeded the community with a bunch of black gay men who know how to do all kinds of things. So when you give them opportunities, they will succeed, but you need to make sure those opportunities are available, that funding is multi-year and exists. It has realistic targets about it, and it understands the true needs of that community. Sometimes the need, like you want an HIV test done, but what you really want is those trans, girl, trans girls to come in. And so maybe, maybe if you do some name change work for them, and maybe if you have, a, say, a clothing exchange that's an option, and you have some makeup tutorials, or maybe just some sports teams they can play with. You know, I'm not going to box them into anything. But give people some services that, that they want. They might also braid in what they're going to do on this uh, funding piece. And maybe if we thought of housing as a prevention tool, oh. 
Mm. Perhaps that could <laughs> help us to get the numbers down. Daniel, you're muted. Ah, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> no, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, being paid just to exist. Boom. You know, truly meeting individuals where they are, you know, are, is the best is the best um, way forward. So I really, really like that. And I love the masterclass that you all um, are giving um, the folks. You know, I, I, I'm not going to be like Ari Melber and like drop lyrics to rap song. I won't do that. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, shout out to King Street, South Carolina. They are in the comments. That's my family members from King Street. And Tari people is from King Street too. That's our family members. <laughs> That's our family members. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So let's switch up a little bit and let's, um, let, let's have a conversation about stigma. So we continue to see the impacts of HIV stigma, not only um, impacting individuals living with HIV, but also individuals who may be accessing um, prevention services. So when you think about stigma, um, why don't we begin with giving the a working definition to folks who are watching us? Um, so who wants to dive in first? So I will first offer this as a definition, certainly not the end-all be-all, but stigma is, re is fear that's real to you. You know, I, I'm cool with snakes. They make great purses and shoes, but I know that some people are terribly afraid of snakes. So that fear is real to them. Stigma for some people can be absolutely uh, life-threatening. Um, it, it can be so many other things. And, and I think one of the ways that I help uh, in my community with trans women in particular, um, and then with trans people and non-binary people in general, and then with Black people, is making sure that folks understand stigma. It's real to you though it may not be something. There's certain, that self-imposed stigma is real. There may be other types of stigma that come as well. There are people who will, um, I've often heard in conversation, I've been in conversation with people and, and we may describe uh, one of the feelings that people have after a new diagnosis of HIV is they feel like there's the scarlet letter, like Hester Prynne um, on their head. You know, she had an A for adulterer, and some people feel like they have an A for AIDS or an H for HIV. And that's real. It's real to you. Um, and it hurts, and it's scary, and it can also be uh, life-threatening as well. Thank you for that, Tori. Matthew, how about you? What would you add to that definition? You know, I would say that even that just the, the perception alone of something or the fear of what someone's response can be, can have deadly outcomes. Um, the the fear that, you know, I have a, a friend of a friend right now who's laying in a hospital bed dying from car carposis sarcoma lesions uh, because he does not see that he would have a value in his life because of the HIV diagnosis. And so he doesn't take his medication and he doesn't think that anybody would want him and then anybody needs him. And that despite having a friend who wants to be there for him, he, he still doesn't see the world is a place that is there for him. And that is literally killing him. And, you know, I tell this story because it's repeated so in day in and day out of people just, you know, we're 40 years in and we still have such terrible knowledge of people understanding where HIV is now, what HIV means, what the power of medication is, what that medication means for your life, what that means for other people. Because we're bad at sexual health education in this country. We don't talk to people about things and we leave things in these dark and shadowy murky places. And then, and then the fear creeps in, the unknown creeps in and people die. People don't get care. People's lives are impacted. And it is our inability to make the connection through that makes this so terrible. And, and we do, we try to do work that fixes that and we're still stuck. It's why we still have HIV criminalization laws on the books in so many states. Fear thank, you. thank you for lifting that. I, I think it's um I, I think that's cr crucial, you know, especially as we um think about you know the ongoing impacts of stigma. Um, 
especially, you know, at that intersection of um, Black communities. I, I think the... I, I think the three of us, you know, live in the deep South. Um, so, you know, geography and stigma also play a really interesting role in this conversation. I think even within um, your statement, you know, you lifted up the fact that you have a friend who, you know, is dying um, connected to HIV. And, and, you know, we still see individuals who transition from HIV more times than not, they look like you and I, yep. you know, um, they're from states where, you know, Tor um, Tori and I live, you know, I, I think more than, we had more than 800 um, individuals, you know, die in Georgia last year uh, with HIV, you know? Um, so I definitely think stigma is, is really, really, really is still um, across, you know, our different uh, communities. When you think about solutions or even just workarounds, you know, how have you seen um, the reduction of stigma play out in different um, communities? I'll, I'll credit uh, a CDC campaign, well, New York City, and then a CDC uptake of it is the, the discussion of status neutral work. Um, so everybody needs help, everybody needs care, everybody needs support. Um, we can deliver it in a way that is not necessarily linked to what your HIV status is. We can say that no matter what happens to you, we wanna make ensure that you have good health care and good health outcomes. So we can offer you a pill either way. We can say, what are you doing to protect your health either way? We can say, how are you feeling supported in your social system either way, regardless of your status? And that can slowly start breaking things down and just getting people into the mindset of like, Everybody needs health and everybody needs care and everybody's got things going on. Thank you. Go ahead, Tori. So while Matt's coming back, I will add, I think that there's a there's some great places for status neutral work. And then there are other places where status neutral in itself can actually be a bit stigmatizing. Okay. Um, my experience is uh, that there are times when people who are living with HIV simply want to have conversations with folks who are living with HIV. There's a share, there's a type of connectedness there um, that, you know, if you know, you know. And I think that there are times when people talk about pill fatigue. If you're, if you're not a person who takes medicine specifically for HIV, pill fatigue is one of those things that can look very, very different for, for you. Um, so many other different things. And so certainly we want to, as much as we can, have more options for people because options is the word that comes to mind um, more often than not. We have to have a lot of options because we're a lot of different people. Uh, one thing is never going to work. You and I have family. Uh, both of our grandmothers have the same name and are from the same town and yet are different people. And we're not going to say it in case anybody works for the IRS. <laughs> Um, that's on this call. But so there's a similarity there. But what would work for you in terms of prevention as a person who's living with HIV or as a, or as a person who doesn't have HIV may not necessarily work for me simply because we they're different, um, as my pastor says, because of the vicissitudes of life. We have different experiences and, you know, we navigate the streets differently and we're viewed differently. We have different social security numbers and all of those other things. So folks want and need and deserve as many options as they can. That's why there's not one HIV medicine that works for everybody. Um, that's why there's not just one provider of HIV services in cities like Atlanta, even though there are in some places. Um, that's why... Uh, there's so many different conversations that have been had and continue to be had and, and will continue to need um, simply because there's so many different voices and attitudes and, and perspectives that really need to be taken into account. So folks need, want, and deserve as many options, many healthy options as they can get. I, I just want to pop in on the you know, we, we've had this long discussion in the HIV field for a while about the choice agenda. And it is so very true. You need to give people ways that prevent HIV that fit into the context of their lives. Call it behaviorally congruent interventions if you need to be nerdy about it. But it's saying, some of you, a condom might work. 
Some of you want prep. Some of you want to use a vaginal ring. Some of you want to use an insertive condom. Some of you want to use a douche. Some of you are hoping for a vaccine. Some of you are just having oral sex. Some of you are just, you know, getting up in your suits and things. And by suits, I mean like a gimp suit, you know, and doing some just kicky stuff. But what I'm saying is we got to find for every individual and every one of their approaches. Now, they're not all going to be all that different, but we're going to have to buck, make some buckets. One of the things I said at the FDA hearing to get PrEP approved was that the current package of prevention options is not working for young Black gay men. And it was true. And I didn't know at the time that 10 years later, that the new prevention option would still not be working for Black gay men. And not because they won't take it. We have studies that show they'll take it because we don't have conditions that make it usable for them in the context of their lives. So you dropped so many nuggets. You said condoms, you said prep, you said a douche, you said a vaccine. Um, you told the people that you were at the prep hearing 10 years ago. Uh, so a lot, a lot. I told um, you at the beginning, I get around. <laughs> so let's, let's go, let, let's go through a couple of those things. Okay. So, um, a sentence about, um, a, a douche, how, how can douching or what, what douche is out there or maybe so, out there to help prevent HIV? One so day? let me bucket some things for okay. folks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Help so me. condoms, behaviors, um, needle exchange, because needle exchange is a prevention opportunity, uh, oral prep for either on demand or daily use, injectable prep at the every two month cycle. These are all things, and the vaginal ring, unless you're in the United States, because then it's not approved here. But the other five things are things that exist in current prevention practices that we have now. Products you can get if you go to a provider and ask for it. In the pipeline, because we're always trying, like we said, we're trying to figure out what else do you need? What can we do better at? How do we give you all the options? We are researching a douche. So for those who douche, uh, instead of just squirting your normal water up your bum, which you should only be really squirting your water, none of those chemicals. For ladies too, all y'all, don't be squirting chemicals up your bum. Not really, just water, maybe a pinch of salt. But we're working on a, vag we're working on a douche that is specifically designed for the rectum to not irritate your cells and to give you protection. Look at that. We're looking at long acting implantables. So see the injectable right now gets you two, every two months. Look at every six months. Or a pill that could be once a week instead of every day. Um, we're looking at vaccines. Um, so vaccines, we're, think of the same way as we have vaccines now. So multiple shots. Uh, probably we're not seeing anything less than three or four at the moment. Um, but that would confer lifelong protection or have a, an extended period of protection where you don't have to re-up on the other things. Those are all the things we're looking at. And we're also looking at, um, I should say, for vaginal rings, for women and, actually, actually let me change that, people of uh, pregnancy potential, we are looking at multi-purpose rings that not only would do an STI prevention, but also have a hormonal contraceptive. So all of that is, the we've got the toolbox right now. I actually prefer to think of it as uh, the church lady's makeup hat, the church lady's purse, because oh. the church lady purse always has something. She got some candy for you. She got some wipes. She got some aspirin. She may have a bottle of water. Whatever you need, you can find in there. A flask. Yes. <laughs> and so we look at this and we say, what do we have now? What more do we need to add to it? Of the things we have now, tell us your experience with them so we can tell you if you need more. We're also looking at a fast dissolving insert, little pill that you could stick either in your vagina or your rectum. And within 30 minutes, it would be dissolved and also provide it protection. Boom, like mind blown, okay. Oh, and I missed it on the front. Uh, decreasing STIs is also prevention. Um, it does, if you treat clear STIs, you definitely reduce your risk of HIV as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Tori, anything any, anything that, that should also be included in this conversation? Oh my goodness, Reverend Rose covered so much of it. Uh, I really can't think of anything else. Oh, but I, well, I did think of something else. 
I certainly don't want anybody to think that talking is a passive action because there is power in education. And what I think also needs to happen is we need to be able to talk about sex rather than just showing it. You know, you can turn on the television right now and watch somebody's private parts. Um, and that's wonderful. And I'm a fan of that. Um, I show mine off as often as the law allows me to. Um, you know, I'm also a fan of dishing because I think it's important to have a clean kitchen in case someone wants to eat there. But we need to be able to talk about sex in a way that helps us get to the end, that helps people understand what HIV is and what it isn't, what prevention is and what prevention isn't. If we allow only nurses and only doctors and only people who write prescriptions to educate our community, our peers, our sisters, brothers, and others about PrEP and about HIV treatment, then we're missing huge opportunities for people to make informed decisions. Because remember, we already talked about code switching. And we know how to talk to each other in ways that we get it. You both, you um, uh, before we went live, Matt used a colloquialism to talk about you. I thought it was absolutely hilarious, also accurate. But we wouldn't necessarily say that on a live, um, particularly when it's being sponsored, sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. And my sister, Nikayla, is also on this live. We'll say things to each other. It, it, that it, other it, folks it, might not it, get. It, and until we're able to have real conversations it, with people using peer-to-peer -peer models, then we're also fighting an uphill battle as well. I, I want to, real quick, Daniel, uh, because I, I think I need to push one last point, and I don't think I heard it enough. One of the great things we can do for both prevention and stigma reduction is remember that the people who are get to undetectable status are have untransmittable virus, which means you can't get HIV from those who are undetectable. And we've, we have like stupid data on this. Like you would have to have sex for over 7,000 person years to maybe get a chance. Most of you, actually none of you will live for 7,000 person years. But Yeah, I wouldn't want this body after 7,000 years. I'm cool with it now, but after <laughs> can I share a quick, a, a quick you equals you story with you all? Yes, yes, you do. yes, you can. And we have a question in the uh, box. So share your story, Tori, please. All right. So years ago, so, you know, back in the day before churches closed, thanks to COVID. So I was at a revival years ago and there was this beautiful couple, um, a black couple, a, a black woman and a black man. And they had three beautiful black children. And uh, they were testifying. He was testifying, actually. He was testifying about how good the Lord was was to them and how they had these three beautiful children. And that is how his wife had HIV. And he didn't. And neither did their children. And this was probably, this was 20 something years ago in a church service. And, uh, and she took his, her medicine every day and all this other stuff. And God, because they were faithful, God had blessed them. And so what we didn't realize at the time is they were actually talking about you equals you, even then before we had the, the verbiage, the term, the acronym, the hashtag you equals you to go along with that. People with HIV have proven oh, since, the, since 95 and 1996, folks who've been adhering to their medicines and who have gotten to an undetectable viral load have had children who don't have HIV, have had Many, 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 many wonderful sexual experience, many sexual experiences without passing on HIV and have gone on to live very healthy lives in spite of having HIV simply because they took the medicine and got to and maintained an unde undetectable viral load. And so people were proving science before the science proved the science. And I want us to make sure that we, we used to use the term TASP, T-A-S-P, treatment is prevention. Um, and we don't see that as much anymore, but we also want to make sure that we're, again, talking to people, that people understand how important treatment is to eradicate HIV, to get rid of, to end the HIV epidemic. Y'all are talking real good tonight. Okay, so let me be the facilitator. Let me hit some questions that we um, have in the chat box and some comments. Number one, the first comment is you all are rocking it out. So continue to do that. 
Um, the folks have really, really liked your commentary on the many, 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 many. many sexual partners and sexual activities. They like I've that. had a few myself. Got it. Uh, so the first question. That is my ministry. <laughs> the first question. And I, I, I'll give it to the both of you guys. So we talked about those prevention options earlier. How do we ensure that rural communities are not left behind? So we have two places uh, that we're working on this with, I'd say, intently. One, there are uh, providers who are trying to get to those rural communities and do education for those rural communities. Um, it is obviously more challenging, especially when we only have one doc. Obviously, as Tori and I talked about stigma being a challenge, um, it, it makes it difficult. What I can say is on the prep side of things, we do have at least two, maybe three um, providers uh, companies that will do mail order prep. So you can order your all your labs and they'll send you all your medications and they'll send it in very like non -dis in very discreet boxes. So you, like people don't know what's coming, but that gives one point of access. It's not a perfect point of access, but at least gives you the option to do that. And you can still apply your, um, you can still do uh, work with them to make sure that it's affordable. And, and those companies work really hard to make sure that happens. So those are the, the two things that come to my mind, but Tori might have some others. Well, options, the word options came to mind again. We know one thing from COVID is that telehealth works for a lot of people. And so making sure that people have an op, people who live in rural areas, certainly in communities as well, but we're specifically talking about rural areas, the people who live in rural communities have access to a doctor on their cell phone if they have cell service or some other way so that folks don't have to drive three hours to go and get blood just to come back a, a week later to, to actually have a doctor's appointment. But making sure that people have options. Mail order is a great option for some people. Um, telehealth is a great option for some people. But I think most importantly, or, or equally as important, is making sure that people have the type of information that's going to help them to make the healthiest choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. I love and that. rural uh, rural communities looks very different from state to state as well. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And I love I love the point. You know, individuals have to have their have to have the choice and the access to decide what's best for them. I think that's truly a take home. Um, next question: Why do you think it's so hard for communities, or is it hard for communities to accept U equals U? You're going against 30 years of counter-programming. Mm -hmm. um, I still remember in high school when they had like the scary video of HIV coming to get you. And like you're, you're talking about a concept that has really only been socialized for the last five, six years. Um, and, and so we're still, we're still getting used to it and we're still understanding. We know that there is levels of medical mistrust, especially in the black community. So someone saying that this doctor told me isn't necessarily the greatest messenger. But having stories like the one Tori told about the couple who had their kids, that is a messenger. And we have to make spaces and opportunities for people to safely disclose their status and disclose what U equals U has done for them in their lives and uplift those stories. Wonderfully said, Matthew. I think there's also a, a certain amount of judgment um, that comes in because we do have as a society, we have such a difficult time talking about healthy sex healthy sex. We can talk about sex, but we have a difficult time talking about healthy sex. And when we're talking about you, what we're talking about is healthy sex, regardless as if there's a condom involved, regardless as if there is a jail, a ring, uh, or any other uh, prevention modality other than you equals you. And so there's a bit of judgment that goes in, certainly for many people who are not living with HIV, who don't understand how you can have HIV and still enjoy using your body part or giving the access to your body parts to other people. And then there are people who, because of how they feel about their own HIV diagnosis, sometimes judge others based again on how they, what they wanna do with their bodies and, and how they wanna experience pleasure. And so once we get to a point that first of all, we understand that U equals U has been proven many, 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 many times before, and that people, all people who want to deserve to have healthy, pleasurable sex, then it makes us easier to understand that there are ways to do that 
simply by taking the medicine that you're being prescribed anyway, by actually paying attention to what a doctor said. Imagine that. Oh, beautiful. So we're coming to the top of the hour. I think I want to ask two quick, I know you you guys like are just amazing, okay? Uh, so I think I want to ask two quick ones. Um, the first one, is, and I think you all have demonstrated um, this, and it would be the uh, importance of language. So throughout our conversation tonight, we have not said target population. We have not said, you know, at risk population or anything like that. So maybe can you give the good people um, of YouTube, Facebook, um, a sentence or two on why language is important when we when we talk about HIV? So I'm going to say you should go first on this one. Well, I've already said it a million different times and in several different ways. Language is important because people need to understand the message. People need to understand message in, is in ways that they get it. And so being a talk when, when we're doing capacity building assistance and, and talking with providers who are having a difficult time engaging with people, say it all the time, you need to be multilingual. Multilingual doesn't mean you need to speak Spanish, French, and Russian, but what it means is that you need to be able to speak in a way that you learned at university, but you also need to speak in a way that Daniel's mom can get it and Tori's mom can get it and both of our grandmothers who have the same name, who happen to be from the same city, but live in different places, that they get it. And both of our granddaddies get it and both of our step granddaddies get it. You have to be able to talk in ways that young black men get it, but also in ways that old black men get it. And, and that can be difficult, but it's worth it. You know, I, I think it comes back down to the, the piece we were talking about with stigma. Um, the language we use and the words we use matter. If words were not so important, people would not work so hard to figure out how to say the exact right thing to you all the time. Or when we fumble for words and we look for things because we want to be understood and we want people to understand where, what we're trying to convey in a moment. And I say for HIV, it's always essential that you start with the person first. So we try to use people first language, talking about what happens for a person, what's like for that person and how we discuss and when you're trying to translate to someone, because really that's what you're doing. You're doing your own form of translating and acting as a liaison. You're trying to think about how do I make this person who I have this relationship with, how do I make them understand our mutual stuff expanding to this conversation of why this health thing is good for me or is important to me or matters in the context of my life. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Shout out to my grandma. She's in the comment section. Uh, <laughs> she says, hello, everyone. So I think uh, the comment that will take us home, um, if, there's some, if there's someone out there watching us right now who is interested in getting on prep or interested in restarting, um, you know, their treatment, what would you tell them right now so we'll let the guys have the last word but i would first make sure that they understand how important they are to their own health care um, and what i mean by that is that you deserve to be healthy you deserve to be happy and one way if you're a person who has hiv to do that is by getting on and remaining on treatment. If you're a person who doesn't have HIV and you happen to fall into what the CDC calls a high risk group, then one of the best ways that you can protect yourself, first of all, is know, um, know your options and then utilize some of them. Um, it, PrEP is not for everyone, but if it's for you, try it. Try it, all right? You are the most important person in that equation. And I, I always want to reiterate that to people. My goal is always to help take the conversation of HIV out of the equation so you can just go live your life. And so I want you to take options that make your life better, take fear out of your life, take stigma out of your life. Um, as my colleague Jim Pickett always says, the only re reason HIV prevention works is because we make things hotter, wetter, better. Um, and we want you to, to enjoy a hotter, wetter, better life. 
And the best way to do that is for you to make informed decisions about what's going on. So many times in our lives, our choices are taken away from us. We don't get to make the decision we want. We don't get to know about the decision we want. HIV is a place where there are so many great resources out there that can allow you to understand what's happening and what your options are. And also, when you pick an option, you don't have to stay with an option, but you do have to pick an option and see if it works. That's you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your health. This is both, both treatment and prevention, folks. Invest in you because Black lives do matter. And if Black lives matter, then Black health has to also matter. Oh, that is excellent. So before we say good evening to the beautiful people out there, tell folks how do they stay in touch with you on social media or any of that um, online stuff. Tori Cooper, my name is on the screen. You put an MS in front of it because I'm a miss. I'm too old to be a miss at yahoo.com and Tori Cooper everywhere else. <laughs> Thank you, Tori. Matt, how about you? Uh, I am MTK Rose on Twitter. And uh, if you need to email me, now write this down. Email Daniel Driffin. <laughs> and I am at D Driffin on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So for some additional information, please, please, please do not hesitate to first visit blackdoctor.org. BDO is the world's largest and most comprehensive online health resource specifically prioritizing African Americans. BDO understands the uniqueness of Black culture, our heritage, and our tradition, and specifically how it plays in the role of our health. BDO gives you access to innovative new approaches to the health information you need, everyday language, so you can break through the disparities, gain control, and live your life to the fullest. Um, all of the data that we shared at the beginning of our discussion can be accessed through AIDSview.org. AIDSview is a free um, interactive website um, that truly makes HIV um, and other health disparities make sense at everyday language. Also, feel free to visit HIV.gov. That is the one-stop shop where you can find the federal response to how um, the United States is addressing HIV um, across our country and our territories. HIV in All of Us is an interactive website where you can learn more about vaccine trials and um, upcoming um, activities um, hosted by the HIV Vaccine Trial Network. Again, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, and we hope you have a good night.